Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for taking the time to attend today's town hall meeting. My name is Maria Lynn Budworth. I'm a faculty member from the School of Human Resource Management, and I will be your moderator this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce today's panel. Most of them will be quite familiar to you. Here's our president, Mamdou Shukri, president and vice chancellor. Our uh, provost and vice president academic, Rhonda Lenton. Our vice president research and innovation, Robert Hache. Our vice president finance and administration, Gary Brewer. And our vice president advancement, Jeff O'Hagan. Each will have a turn to talk to you during uh, the next uh, the, the time we spend together. I would also like to express a warm welcome to those viewing online. We have quite a few who have logged in through our webcast and are viewing us remotely. We also have a viewing room at Glen on the Glendon campus, so welcome to those of you who are watching us from Glendon. It's great to have you join us today. So why do we have a town hall? This is an annual event that's an important uh, effort in, in the university's ongoing uh, at, uh, ongoing efforts to ensure that there's open communication and dialogue between all members of the campus. It's an opportunity for staff, students, and faculty to engage in constructive dialogue, to talk about the things that concern you, that concern your faculties, your units, and your departments within the institution. This is an opportunity for us to hear what you want. And you'll note that a lot of the things that we talk about during this town hall end up influencing the decisions made by the university. So I please, I invite you all to be engaged and to, to, uh, uh, to, to let us hear your voice during this town hall meeting. A few points how, about how we will, discuss, uh, we will conduct the discussion today. In a moment, I will introduce the president, and who will give some opening remarks uh, about today's meeting on this, a state of the university address. That's the title of today's talk. Following the president's remarks, each of the four vice presidents will provide a brief update on their respective portfolios. The president will then return briefly to uh, discuss the ongoing challenges for the university going forward. And then I will invite everybody here to contribute uh, through a question and answer period. And each of the presidents and vice presidents will be prepared to answer any of your questions at that point in time. There are a number of ways that you can ask the question. For those of you in the room, there will be roving microphones, and I, if you just let me know that you have a question, I can, I can point one towards you. For those of you who are watching us online, you can ask a question through the website, which is www.yorku.ca forward slash town hall, or you can post the question to Twitter at hashtag yutownhall, hashtag yutownhall. We will have our Twitter team also on stage with us here who will uh, organize the questions and pass them to me and I'll be able to ask them on your behalf. So lastly, if I could ask that you please turn off your cell phones as a courtesy to everybody in the room, including all of us on stage, make sure our cell phones are muted. Um, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the President and Vice Chancellor of York Un University, Mamdou Shukri, who will share his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have so many of you here today to have an opportunity to, uh, to talk about the university, our achievements, and, and uh, our future. What I intend to do today is very briefly uh, talk about our achievements since last year, since the uh, last town hall meeting, and uh, talk about some of the challenges we are facing. And as you heard, every vice president will uh, come in and, and share with you uh, their relevant uh, perspective. It is, let me first talk about the environment in which we are operating as we talk about our achievement. We're really working or operating now within a very complex and increasingly difficult uh, environment. There are significant uncertainty about government policy. Government is concerned about the financial situation in the universities. Government is concerned about uh, differentiation. Issues of differentiation is very important. like to see highly differentiated missions for different universities. They're also uh, concerned about the funding formula, reviewing how universities are funding. Any change in these things can have an impact on any university. Of course, York being a significant university, we are not immune from any of the changes that ha can take place as a result of changing government policy. Second, we are really going through a new experience in Ontario. We are used to an environment where there's growth in student population, 
we are really reaching a point where actually there is the, the student population of those in the age of 18 to 24 will for a number of years be flat. That will actually not be flat everywhere. In fact, it is flat at this point in time, but very soon there will be an increased demand within the GTA uh, and decreased demand in other areas of the province. That, that doesn't mean that we, have, we will have the enrollment we need because there will be a very, we'll be living through a very competitive uh, landscape that we'll have to navigate our way with it, as other universities will seek attracting students from the GTA. <coughs> Another, of course, challenge that you are fully aware of is actually the fact that the, uh, the imbalance between the increase in our revenue and increase of our expenses. As you've heard me saying once and again, uh, on average, over the last number of years, our revenue have increased between 1% to 2%, mostly through tuition fees. However, our costs have increased by close to 4 to 5%, and this is fundamentally due to uh, increased the payroll, increased salaries, as well as increasing cost of operating university, be it uh, energy or, or what have you. And that imbalance we manage, most, most other universities and as well as York, we manage to deal with through growth and through enhanced efficiencies. And we have been doing very well at that. However, this thing cannot, will continue with us as one can see, and we'll have to be able to deal with this. So the challenges are very well known to your government policy, uh, uh, student enrollment, uh, and financial uh, constraints. Now, where we are, where are we? where's York University, where are we these days? We have made very clear that we have a very clear strategic priorities. And these strategic priorities are listed uh, on the slide behind me. Let me share with you what I think have been our achievement at the, in the past year and over the last few years in these areas. When it comes to academic excellence, enhancing academic excellence, I feel we've, we've been doing very well. We've done very well over the, last, over the last year and the last number of years. Our effort for research intensification continue to, uh, to move very well. And as reflected in the increase in the funding from Granting Council, the increase in number of Canada researchers that are allocated to York University, uh, as well as the increase of a number of our colleagues who are being honored for their achievement. However, we, are, we also have a, a, a strategic plan to continue to increase our research intensification effort. Comprehensiveness is a strategic priority for us. And I think, we, as you can see the evidence, we're doing quite well in this with the increased uh, efforts in the area of engineering, health, uh, and business, and so on. We continue to go in these areas to become a more comprehensive university, but this is not done at the expense of our strength in our traditional areas of strength being humanities, social sciences, art, law, business, and so on. So I think we're moving in the right direction in this, and we have shown in the last year that we are moving in the right uh, direction. We continue to uh, streamline our programs under the leadership of the provost and, and the deans. Graduate education is another area I think we started to do much better uh, at. Graduate education is central to our ability to become a more research intensive university and would like to have a system that is both efficient as well as enabling our graduate students to have uh, to meet their aspirations. And uh, I think the, 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 the development that has been taking place over the last year, and hopefully will continue, is to basically align graduate education with the individual uh, uh, academic units. I think it will, be, uh, will pay dividends. You cannot have academic uh, excellence in your programs without having the right infrastructure, and we indeed over the last number of years, and particularly last year, we have seen a significant increase in infrastructure supporting academic excellence. The new engineering building is going to be a truly iconic building and actually an efficient building in delivering uh, uh, excellent programming. You look at what happened at Glendon, again, one of the jewels in York's crown, uh, and we are very uh, strongly committed to, the, uh, to bilingual education at York University. You look at the center of excellence there, look at life-size building, we have been moving in building better infrastructure to be, make able to, to be able to strengthen uh, uh, our academic programming. Students, of course, are the center of everything, and student success is central to uh, uh, all our priorities. Teaching and learning, uh, learning innovation has been central to what we're trying to do. Ha we have had significant strides in the last year in the area of uh, ex uh, uh, enhanced uh, technology-enhanced learning in the area of experiential learning, which are things that will add 
to the quality of the academic programs and the way we deliver our academic uh, programs. We continue to be committed to increasing or protecting the complement, faculty complement. We've added a, a school of continuing education that will again enable us to reach out and enhance what we offer and address the needs not only of traditional students who are in the, in the age of 18 to 24, but also uh, uh, mature uh, student. Uh, needless to say, we continue to be a leader in uh, areas of student mobility and credit transfer. I always remind everybody who talks about the importance of creating pathways for students uh, that York University is actually the, leaders, the leader in, uh, in, in accommodating students with prior college experience. And now we're working with Seneca College to actually develop new programs that uh, will enable uh, our uh, Canadian students to uh, have the benefits of both university and college uh, education. Community engagement is again an area that is very important for us. York from day one have made sure that it is linked to its communities and we define community broadly from local from the internal community, local community, all the way to international community. And as such, we have been doing very well. Social innovation is a reflection of our commitment to community. By social innovation, I mean the capacity of the university to use its research in humanities and social science to support communities. And we are the leader in social innovation. In fact, we are leading a consortium of 11 universities with strong commitment to social uh, innovation. Internationalization and the commitment to internationalization is a reflection of the fact that we believe that our students should be trained to become uh, citizens of the world. And uh, it's not only reflected in the success in increasing the percentage of international students uh, who come to York University, but also in the increase in the number of York University students who are studying abroad. As a matter of fact, the last numbers I have seen uh, uh, today, we have close to a thousand students from York University who are uh, spending a semester somewhere uh, overseas. So we continue to try and do everything possible to enhance the reputation of York University as a global uh, university. Our reputation, frankly, is on the rise. I see all the evidence of that, and I'm very proud of our new uh, brand uh, campaign that you see the evidence of it uh, around us. Uh, sustainability and resource integration is an area where, again, uh, of strategic priority to, to us, we've done very well in enhancing our productivity through our planning. York is committed to a very strong, we have been committed to a very strong planning culture. We not only have strategic plans, we also have implementation plan. And IRRP is an example of an implementation plan. How to take your priorities that are clearly defined, that were developed through working with the entire community, how you take these strategic priorities and turn them into a plan to implement them. And that York has been a leader in this. And I think this will be reflected in our capacity to sustain the university in the future, uh, financially and otherwise. Needless to say, we are also a leader in sustainability. We have been receiving so many awards uh, 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 in this area, and we continue, and there's, I think, clear evidence in many of the things we are doing, uh, which was reflected in orientation and other areas, our commitment to issues of human rights and issues of uh, social uh, uh, justice. So, again, maintaining our leadership in, uh, in sustainability is a significant uh, uh, objective of the university. Now, I admit that I had to go through all of these things uh, fairly quickly, and uh, I'm uncharacteristically finishing in the time that has been allocated to me. Uh, but uh, there may be other elaborations I can uh, share with you through the question uh, period. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our provost to take it from here and, uh, and, and expand and talk about what, is, what lies ahead in the coming year. Thank you very much, Mamdu. So I think most of you know that the role fundamentally of the provost and the VPA is about coordinating, facilitating, and supporting the success of the faculties and of the university more broadly in achieving excellence. I think we've really come together as a community and it's embedded in our university academic plan that quality and excellence has to be our top goal in everything that we do. 
And as part of that role of facilitating, supporting, coordinating, the VPA has a particular role in trying to support and lead the development of the planning that supports those efforts. And we all know that back in uh, about five, six years ago, that we developed a white paper that really emerged as the need to develop a vision for the university when we did the employee engagement survey, a long-term vision out to 2020. And out of that, that vision then informed that particular five-year university academic plan, which is passed, goes to Senate and is passed by Senate. The VP uh, Research and Innovation will be talking to you a little bit more about the strategic research plan that complemented that plan. And then that really was the foundation upon which we negotiate our contract with government under the strategic mandate agreement. But all that academic piece then really needs operational plans about how to, you know, can we coordinate those initiatives across the campus so that we can identify the pockets of strength, opportunities to collaborate and to partnership. And we did that through the integrated resource planning framework at the local level some 40 plus different integrated resource plans that articulate how to, the metrics and so forth. More recently, after we did this major review across the university, we came to the conclusion that there would be value in having an institutional level integrated resource plan that might identify a few initiatives at the pan-university level that could really complement those local plans. And then all of that context is incredibly important context to this crucial time now when we're about to embark on the development of the next university academic plan 2015-20. And as we undertake those efforts, we always need to be mindful of the external landscape. The president has outlined some of the challenges, but also how are our competitors? How are also, while they're competitors, they're often also partners as well. What is happening in the system? And there is a huge range of a lot of innovation that is happening now in the university sector for thinking very differently about even how we generate alternate sources of revenue for the university. How can we exploit technology? Um, how can we improve accountability? How can we talk about ourselves and communicate what we're doing and so forth? And we're very, we, we think about that external context when we're developing our own plans. And when we do that, the question that we have to also ask ourselves is, in this competitive, challenging landscape, what really sets York apart? And I know that some people feel that that kind of, we shouldn't be you know, always framing in terms of differentiation. And it's not really so much about even the differentiation argument, but it's sort of about really making sure that we are communicating in the province and internationally about York's strengths. What's, what, why should people choose York? We are a university without borders. That's such an apt description for us because we are committed to interdisciplinarity. We are committed to internationalization. We are committed to community engagement. We also, in terms of our student surveys especially, it really emerged that we are seen as an approachable university. We're committed to access. We are also seen as an innovator, a progressive university, committed to new ways of thinking. We've got something quite unique at York University in that we have this tremendous strength in the liberal arts education. And we have combined that in very interesting ways with a huge strength in professional studies. And building on those two pockets of strength across the university, we're well known for that. Mm, thank you. And so the, the, the question that we have to turn ourselves to then is that what is the next step that we need to be thinking about? in terms of actually ensuring that we are building on those strengths of what uh, differentiates York from the other universities and, and what sets us apart. And we have a very clearly articulated mission and some, some unique elements about that, our commitment to social justice. We have a well-articulated vision about where we want to be in 2020, research-intensive, comprehensive, internationally recognized, an engaged university, very well-articulated. We need to be thinking about our values. We are committed to interdisciplinarity. We're committed to inclusivity and diversity. We're approachable. We're progressive. 
And then in that context, to clearly articulate in this next university academic plan as next steps, some bold thinking about what do we want our priorities to be and what are the initiatives that are going to get us there that still advance quality, student success, community engagement, outreach, but also our commitment to bilingual education, our commitment to having another campus uh, in Markham, our commitment to sustainability. We have the tools. We've got strategic enrollment management. We have our integrated resource planning framework. We have a new budget model that you'll be hearing about shortly. And most importantly, we have the people. And my invitation to all of you today and, and over this next year is we will only be successful with bottom-up ownership of change. All of us working together, we're on the right path, we're a strong university, and that's my invitation to all of you today. Many of you will know and have seen the Institutional Integrated Resource Plan that starts to articulate some of the pan-university initiatives that might really help these efforts. And I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Robert Hache, uh, Vice President of Research and Innovation, to talk a little bit more about the research efforts. And then you'll hear again more about um, the, the, how the budget uh, ties in with all of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. In 2014, York faculty, staff, and students published over 1,700 journal papers, books, conference proceedings, as well as many other numerous exhibitions were, were, were supported, installations, uh, new forms of, uh, of outputs through social media, web-based applications, and that number just continues to grow year over year. And so we are working towards and, and starting to achieve that goal of becoming recognized as a research-intensive university. And what I'd like to do today is, is to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the success we've had in the past year and some of the things that we're working towards going in the future. So, for example, Royal Society of Canada this fall will be introducing seven New York scholars into the Royal College. Three into the College of New Scholars, which is the maximum number that can be elected in any one year, and four senior scholars. In addition, Professor John Tatsos in Lausanne School of Engineering will be receiving the Sir John William Dawson Medal from the Royal Society, recognizing outstanding achievement uh, of his research within the areas covered by the college. The landscape that we have is, however, changing. Uh, and and the, the bar graph behind me illustrates that we have, we have progressed over the last 10 to 15 years from uh, institutions, universities that are primarily driven by individual research accomplishment to a much more collaborative, interactive environment. And this is highlighted by uh, the state of our, our funding from Tri-Council, where we now, as a university, receive more money from the three granting councils for group and collaborative activity than we do for individual activity. And on top of that, there are additional organizations like the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Ontario Research Fund, that provide infrastructure money, again, largely towards collaborative and group activities. And so it, more than ever, it's important to have a conversation about how we interact, how we align, and how we go forward. The, last, the other thing that we've accomplished this year is in developing our translational capacity is to uh, uh, launch what is called Launch Launch U, which is York's new entrepreneurship program for faculty, staff, and students, supports, um, and other mechanisms to encourage entrepreneurship across all sectors, not just for-profit enterprise, but not-for-profits and social enterprise. So the role of the primary role of the VPRI is, is to support this success, and we will continue over the next year to provide a broad array of supports to help researchers, students, to succeed in achieving their research objectives, either through uh, uh, attaining granting funding, uh, organizing conferences, uh, and, and accomplishing other activities, particularly supporting activities at Tri-Council, Canada Council, and so forth. There are also two particular opportunities in the coming year. The first is the Canada First Research Excellence Fund that many of you will have heard of. It's a $950 million opportunity that York is preparing an application in the area of biological and computational vision, but a $35 million application to build, in a very big way, an area of research that's, that's prominent at the university already. 
The second is the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which is having one of its uh, semi-regular, periodic, large-scale competitions for new infrastructure, where there's $450 million on the table. That gets leveraged by two and a half times by the time uh, everything, all the contributors are, are, are together. And that's another opportunity that we've, we've, we're looking for and, and have solicited interest from around the university to develop strong applications that we can be successful at. Now, even with all of this activity and all of the success that we've, we've, ha we've been having, York has still, relative to its size, relatively modest in the amount of research outputs that we have. And we have now a strategic research plan that provides some strategic guidance. We're now entering this year into a conversation, more operational level conversation, about developing a plan for the intensification and enhancement of research. And this is a conversation that has started, it's ongoing. The next opportunity to engage, I encourage everyone, is actually tomorrow. But this plan is meant to have a, a collegial discussion about not how we can do more as a university, but how can we achieve more with respect to the research that we're doing and the research that we're engaging in. And these are some of the areas in which the conversation is gravitating. And so we hope over the, the course of this year to have a good interactive conversation and come back with something that the uh, Collegium uh, will be um, pleased to support. So at this point, I'll, I'll transfer it over to Gary Brewer to talk about financial sustainability. Thanks, Robert. <clears throat> I'm hoping I'll get some applause when I'm done. Uh, I'm not sure I will. <laughs> because uh, with the sustainability theme, in fact, what I'd like to do is, is focus on financial sustainability and in particular cover a couple of aspects of the university's uh, budget context. Uh, this is a slide that many of you may have seen. Um, it's a, a summary of the university's uh, budget plan, the operating budget plan that was a, approved in June of this year. Uh, and you'll first note that uh, along the bottom line there, budget cuts for this fiscal year and next, significant budget cuts. And really that just carries on a, 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 an aspect of budgeting at York that we've seen uh, for some time now. In fact, over the last 20 years, we've seen budget cuts uh, in every year but one. So that reality remains with us and it's part of that challenge. In addition, you'll see that, in fact, there are significant deficits uh, uh, emerging in this budget plan, both in-year deficits and cumulative. Uh, and that's something that has really emerged over the last uh, two budget cycles that we've done, this, this challenge across the university, particularly in the faculties, of, of, of meeting their budgets um, uh, in, in the face of the, the context that we found ourselves. This is a slide that we prepared about a year and a half ago, and it basically takes all of the faculty and, and uh, administrative unit year-end carry-forward surplus deficit balances, tots them up and says, what does that look like? If, if it's greater than zero, it means overall across the university we're balanced. If it goes negative, um, we are in a deficit situation which, which needs to be corrected and it's unsustainable. And as you can see in this chart, in 2014, cumulatively across the university, we ended up in a small deficit. And in fact, we're projecting uh, by the end of uh, the 2015 fiscal year, a 43 plus million dollar deficit. Um, to some extent, this reflects the enrollment uh, situation at the university. During periods of enrollment growth, particularly, for example, during the double cohort, there's new revenue uh, from that enrollment growth. It can be used to cover some of the impacts of the budget cuts and, and maybe mask some of the structural issues. But over the last couple of years, particularly our domestic enrollments, have not only flattened, but they've actually declined. And in the face of the budget cuts that have been continuing, that has exacerbated the challenge and given rise to significant in-year deficits that appear to be growing across the university. So in approving the budget plan in June of this year, one of the essential pieces that the board uh, put before us is essentially said you need to get those structural deficits or those in-year deficits addressed. And they gave us a, essentially a three-year window to work with. Um, there is an understanding that notwithstanding uh, the, the difficulty 
uh, of, 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 of having to manage deficits at the institutional budget level. There is an understanding that it does take time to, to move organizations like universities. Um, so they gave us this three-year window in which to essentially bring those in-year deficits to a balanced position, and that's illustrated by the flattening of the curve. So by 2018, we need to have solved those in-year or structural deficits, um, and it will still leave a residual deficit of 60 or 70 million dollars that we'll have to deal with over the longer term, but the first step and, and our primary focus now is to deal with that um, in your deficit situation. I think when I look at this budget plan, um, one of the things that is, is perhaps different from the 20-odd budget plans that I've been involved with, and that is in all those plans in the past, we've always been able to take in-year deficits or cumulative deficits for a period of time within the budget plan, but at the end of it, we were always back to essentially a balanced budget. As you can see in this budget plan, we don't solve it in-year. We still have a small in-year deficit in 2017-18, and cumulatively, we're nowhere near balanced. In fact, we have a cumulative deficit of almost $70 million, or 8% uh, or more of the operating budget. So you can well imagine that the board spent a lot of time looking at this budget. It underwent an incredible amount of scrutiny. Um, and essentially what they told us is, uh, in approving the budget, you need to do a number of things deal with those structural deficits over a three-year period, move forward with the Institutional Integrated Resource Plan uh, initiatives that they see are as, as important as anything to us achieving our long-term financial sustainability, and move forward with the implementation of the SHARP model. Now, the SHARP model is one that we've been uh, rolling out to, to the community for some time now. We've done community information sessions, we've had online sessions um, uh, and information provided. Um, and at this point, uh, we are moving forward with an implementation in 2017-18. In, in looking at SHARP, and this is a slide that I'm sure many of you have seen, we could look at the accounting of it, the numbers and the mechanics. But what I'd really like to do today is actually come back to the strategic view. Why are we moving forward with SHARP? And I think it's important to remember, at the end of the day, a budget model is just a tool that you use to achieve your academic priorities. Fundamentally, that's what we're trying to do. Admittedly, any budget model has assumptions and, and judgments that have to be applied. Certainly, that's the case with SHARP. But at the end of the day, we've taken a long time with broad community engagement to develop a budget model uh, that we think actually best reflects the York context. And indeed, as we look at the, the benefits that we see in SHARP, it's a model that is transparent. It will ensure that alignment of our scarce resources with the academic priorities. It will give greater control, particularly for the faculties with revenues and costs, and at the end of the day, have a predictable framework for planning that has accountability. So uh, from, from the perspective of the board, from the perspective of, 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 of myself and my colleagues, uh, we see this as an important benefit moving forward. So in summary then, financial sustainability from the perspective of the Vice President Finance and Administration includes um, a, a number of important elements. First and foremost, it is to move forward strongly with the IIRP process, not just on the administrative side to efficiently and effectively provide those administrative services in support of the academic mission, but to do it in a context of protecting academic quality. I believe that in moving forward in that way, uh, we will certainly uh, go a long way to dealing with our enrollment situation. Our enrollment outlook, enrollment health, is fundamental to our financial health or our financial sustainability. And, and, and moving forward with IIRP, I believe, will be particularly important in dealing with our enrollment challenges. And finally, the implementation of the SHARP model um, with a thoughtful and careful transition plan um, that will give us a, an important tool that we can use to get that alignment of the resources with priorities. So that, in a nutshell, is what uh, I have to say this morning uh, about uh, the operating budget of the university. Obviously, our financial context looks beyond at external sources of revenue, and in this context, those will be particularly important. So I'll turn to Jeff to take it from here. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, so I have the pleasure of talking to you today about a very special group uh, in the York community, and that's our alumni. 
We talked uh, a little bit earlier, the president talked about students becoming global citizens. And York is blessed with an incredible alumni community uh, all across the world, uh, filled with global citizens. Uh, the alumni network is large. We have almost 300,000 alumni all around the world, making an incredible impact in many fields. And we're working to connect them with the university, with our strategic priorities, uh, and particularly with our students. And I want to go over a little bit of that with you. But first, I wanted to remind you about some of the great alumni that York University uh, has. So from award-winning actress Rachel McAdams, to astronaut Steve McLean, to our mayor John Tory, to Chief Justice Andrew Mackey Karakatsanis, to award-winning author Joseph Boyden, There's more. There's more than just four. We're not, we're not getting an advancement here. Um, to uh, bank CEO Bharat Masrani, and to news anchor Sandy Ronaldo. These, these are a snapshot of a few of our terrific alumni who have done uh, incredible things. But in fact, all of our alumni are doing amazing things all around the world. So how do we harness the power of a global alumni network that now numbers almost 300,000 people. This is what we do every day. I have the pleasure uh, of working with people all across the campus who engage our alumni every day, and it's a very exciting thing for us to do. So we have many engagement strategies that we use uh, and that we're employing uh, to talk to our alumni, to get them engaged not only with each other, and we do this by hosting events and, and setting up uh, networks all around the world. We want our alumni to work together to, to realize that there's a great network that they, can, that they can connect to. But we also want to connect our alumni to the student experience, to the life of the university. Uh, and so in addition to hosting events uh, in many places around the world, we, we work here on campus quite often with our alumni. And in fact, we now have almost 1,000 alumni working uh, on this campus at York University. So how many in the audience are York alum? Look at the hands. That's terrific. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you for all that you do uh, and, and for committing uh, your professional life also to your alma mater. There's many activities that happen all the time with alumni on campus and our students. And there's many more alumni that come uh, from off of campus that work in other areas uh, to, to mentor students, uh, both in, in official and unofficial programs. So that's what we try to do to really engage uh, our, our alumni in the life of the university. The other important factor at this point, particularly, but it's always been happening, is to engage our alumni to help recruit the next group of students at York University. And in fact, recently when I met with our president for a day, our great president for a day, Seon, I don't know if he's here, uh, but he, we, I had a terrific discussion with him and he told me a, a really great story. He said that when he was considering which university to come to, he really wasn't sure. And he, by the way, was a very top student, one of the, one of the, had one of the highest GPAs, was somebody that universities were really competing for. He got a phone call uh, from an alum of York University who happened to sit on our alumni association board. And that conversation triggered him to come to, to, come to York University. He told me that he wouldn't have come here if it wasn't for that conversation. And that alum who he met became his mentor. Uh, and they've been friends ever since. So this is what we're trying to do to encourage more of, uh, of these kinds of interactions. Alumni can be very important to the university. We want, us, we want them to, to meet each other. We want them to, to help each other, but we want them to help the university and they do that. So we're committed to growing that engagement, growing the, the opportunity for alumni to engage. And we're doing that uh, in a quiet way right now, but we will be doing it in a more public way uh, in, in the months to come. We're on the, the verge of launching one of our most aggressive and, and certainly most ambitious fundraising and engagement campaigns uh, that we've ever undertaken. And alumni are, are, are contributing in many, many numbers to do that. In fact, in addition to all the things that I just talked about, over 35,000 of our alumni and friends have already contributed in the last few years alone over $150 million to York University to support students primarily. Really, the, the, the bulk of the funds go to support scholarships and bursaries. We've created thousands of, thousands of new bursaries. We want to expand that uh, also. Alumni are supporting buildings, they're supporting faculty uh, uh, um, chairs and those kinds of initiatives. So we want to increase our engagement, uh, accelerate our fundraising to, to maximize this impact that alumni can have with the university, with the life of our students. So you'll see more about this campaign 
uh, as time goes by. The goal really is to try to align our efforts uh, to ensure that we, that we uh, are, are, are maximizing the opportunity with our alumni and for our students to also become global citizens like many of our alumni already are. So I'm going to uh, pass things back to the president who's going to talk about the road ahead as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So before we uh, come to... Uh, question and answer, which I actually am looking for. Uh, I like to say a few words about sort of try and put things together. York University, as I said in many occasions, is at an inflection point. What I mean by that, we are a university with incredible potential. And in spite of all what you heard about some of the constraints and difficulties, we have potential that no other university has. We have the capacity to get over the difficulties and build for future in the long run. Look at what we have, been, what we have achieved. You, look, you listen to the significant progress that have been taking place in terms of the academic activities, whether it be it academic programming or research. We're building on tremendous strength and tremendous heritage in humanities, social sciences, the arts, and, and, and many other areas. We have become a more comprehensive university, so we are along the way there. We are becoming more research intensive. We, build, we are in a situation we have solid foundation to build on. We see tremendous opportunities. I see tremendous opportunities in even better programming, more, more comprehensiveness and more research intensification, and more engagement with our community, be it locally or uh, globally. These opportunities are before us based on the strength we have we have charted a direction. Our planning exercises have led us to identify very clearly certain strategic priorities, and we are actually moving along the way in this direction. That said, we have challenges. We have challenges, we have financial challenges, we have challenges that are not unique to York University. These challenges are challenges that are facing the entire system. Then one looks at the opportunities and the challenges we have, and we say we have this tremendous strength in the academic programming. We have op incredible opportunities to serve our communities, our society better. Look at the opportunities in more engagement with the, uh, with the communities, in more uh, uh, engagement of our research and the research results in improving the social and economic uh, uh, life of people in our area. Look at the tremendous opportunity that Glendon College represents for us, <clears throat> building on being the only institution that grants degrees in uh, bilingual degrees in the uh, uh, in South and Western Ontario. So we have all of this opportunity. We have these tremendous difficulties that we share with others. Why I think we are in a unique place to do that? I believe we do because we have a plan. I think we have an opportunity today to look at opportunities to streamline our operation, opportunities to visit all the programs that we're doing, be it administrative programs or academic programs, and see how can we do them better. And I actually will, will go as far as saying I actually resent the notion that we are, in order to deal with this, we have to cut programs. In fact, I look for opportunities to invest in new programs or new versions of current programs, things that we can build on for the future. When we look at the data, the data suggests that we are in an area, that here's the opportunity, we are in an area, in part of the GTA, that will experience significant growth in population and significant demand. We have a new campus. As we try and streamline our operation, we have to do that because we have to deal with the financial issues we have. But we have to do that while thinking of the future, while thinking on long, long term for the university. On trying to, while you streamline your operation, maybe you change this, maybe you cut that. However, while you're doing this, you have to be mindful of the opportunity before you. You have to be clear that what you're doing has to prepare yourself for the next phase where you can grow and expand being a multi-campus university with three campuses and how you're going to be able to absorb and accommodate and actually prepare that future these future generations of people who are 
going to be ready in a few years to come to university, and they will all be in the GTA. So we have a unique opportunity. We're not going to achieve that unless everybody on campus is involved. So this is an opportune, opportune time for everybody. Now it is based on the IRP plan. Now everything is in the hands of the departments and the units. We look forward to hearing from you about the opportunities to do better, to become more efficient, to serve our students and our communities better. But in doing that, we have to do it in a way while we are thinking in the short term how we streamline our operation, we have to do it in a way to, to simultaneously think in the long term, knowing what demands will be upon us from society to deal with the incoming uh, change and the demand that will be uh, put upon us in the future. We have to meet these demands based on building strength today. So we are not in the business of cutting, we are in the business of looking at what we're doing in order to prepare ourselves for the, for, to deal with the current problems and prepare ourselves for the future. So it's all in your hands and I look forward with my colleagues to listen to you and, uh, and be able to answer some of your questions. Thank you. I'd like to start by expressing our thanks to uh, President Shukri and all of our vice presidents for their thoughtful yet efficient comments this morning. To say, when I was given the timeline for, for these talks, I wasn't confident we could do it. But we've pulled it off, and the reason that we are trying to be efficient in our comments is because we wanted to make sure there was enough time for questions from as many people who have them um, both in the room and through the webcast. So. Um, just to set, set the logistics for, for how we'll proceed, I have a few guidelines for how, we will, um, how we, will, we will go through the question and answer period. I'd like to start by, by encouraging as many people to participate as possible. We're hoping to hear from students, from administrative staff, from faculty, uh, so that we can get a range of issues on the, on the table and into, into, the, uh, into the discussion. Um, so in order to do that, I'd ask that you please limit your questions to one per person until everyone has had a chance to ask their first question. If there's still time, I'd certainly love to come back and explore a second question and talk to any other audience members who, who would like to have a chance to speak. For those of you who are live, who are in the, the room with us today, uh, there are rovers, people roving around with microphones. So if you have a question and you're in the room, if you could raise your hand and identify yourself, and then I will indicate uh, that it, it, it that, uh, uh, that is your turn for a question, and, and we'll invite you to do so. Um, also, we'd also ask that before you speak, you identify yourself by your faculty, your program, your unit, your affiliation with the university, and to give others a chance to participate, participate rather, please try to keep your points brief and to the point. That's it. Those are the guidelines. So I will take my seat, and we will begin the question and answer period. Let's start, if we could, with a question in the room before we move on to thank you for the lights. Let's, uh, do we have a question in the room? We do. We have a microphone right there. Thank do you. Do you want me to stand up? <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. I'm Alison collins Marakis from the Office of Research Ethics in the Division of the Vice President of Research and Innovation. And uh, my question is about um, sustainability and putting the principles into practice. I think York has a well-regarded uh, reputation for putting the principles of sustainability into practice with most notably through a number of key greening initiatives such as the bringing the subway to campus. But part of that will be the removal of the buses from uh, the commons. And many of us are really interested in, in uh, the unique opportunity this presents to the university to um, revitalize or reinvigorate the commons. So I'm yeah. interested to hear about, in broad strokes, what you plan to do with the commons. Um, that, that's a great question, uh, Alison. And in fact, it's um, something that uh, I have already discussed with my colleagues, and, and we're quite looking forward to the time when the buses are no longer in the common. Now, um, that, of course, depends on the pace of construction. We understand that the subway will be operational by uh, the end of 2017, um, and uh, hopefully they're continuing to move to that schedule. So it, it gives us a little bit of time that we can think about what we might want to do. Certainly the buses uh, will be moved to the terminal that's being built on uh, steels as part of that steel station, as well as there could be other buses that uh, move further north um, that are associated with some of the regional providers. Um, we have um, uh, begun to, to put together uh, a plan to essentially do a reimagining of the commons. Effectively, we do have a campus map 
master plan, yet sees the common uh, as a very important, in fact, ceremonial space, if you will, on campus, the entrance, the gateway. Uh, and so over the next year or so, uh, we'll be putting together uh, a process to, in a sense, reimagine the common, think about what it is that we could do there to create the kind of space um, in that part of the campus that we think will enhance the campus experience. In fact, if you uh, look at the IIRP, uh, you will find in there something called um, student uh, experience or enhancing the campus experience. I see that very much in keeping with that initiative and in fact that one will be one of the key deliverables that we have. So that will require, I think, input, consultation, engagement with our community, faculty, staff and students to come up with a long-term plan and then within that maybe the pacing of that plan that we can make changes now, we can make changes two to three years and then longer term, but always with a view to creating um, what is a wonderful space for us. Thank you. Is there another question from the room? As we're getting warmed up, I'll, uh, I'll turn to one of the questions that have come to us through our online platforms. A reminder that you can ask your question through hashtag YU Town Hall or through the website yorku.ca forward slash town hall. Uh, this is a question for VP Hache. In what ways can York University, does York University support its students' startup initiatives, and how can students receive this support? So thank you for that question. So I, I refer folks to launchyu.ca. That's the website for LaunchU, the new entrepreneurship program that we've uh, that we've launched this year. It's specifically aimed towards students. It provides a number of workshops, other ac educational activities, uh, and actually runs a intensive 10-week summer program uh, on entrepreneurship and how to start your business. Uh, so there is a suite of, of services that are now available uh, and highly encourage everyone to get in touch with them. Uh, in fact, Nile Goyal, who is the leader of that program, is just waving his hand out there, and please feel free to speak to him at, at, after the session. Great. Excellent. A question from the room? We have one down here, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Reese. I'm a third year undergrad in the uh, device theater and playwriting program in the theater department. Uh, my question is also in line with the sustainability focus and um, with the increasing evidence that fossil fuel investments are both environmentally and financially unsustainable. I was just wondering what steps you've taken to divest fossil fuels from the endowment, and if you have not taken steps, why not? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I have the answer, but he has. He would be very accurate in the answer. Um, well, yeah, it, it, it's um, it, it actually is is a very important area, and it, and it's not one that that's actually um, uh, new in particularly the notion of managing the university's endowments and pension funds for that matter. Together, those two total something in the order of 2.5 billion dollars. So, the notion of of whether it's fossil divestment or other forms of divestment uh, reflecting. Uh, the realities of what's going on in the world is, is not new. Um, the, 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 the position that, that we've taken as a university is to try to develop a thoughtful, planful response for moving forward on these kinds of initiatives. Um, because we do have to manage those funds with, a, in a sense, a fiduciary responsibility, particularly with the pension funds, and we have to make sure that we move forward and never lose sight of why we are holding those funds and the basis upon which we have to manage them. So with that, we have, um, uh, over the years, begun to put together frameworks and processes for allowing the community to engage with the university, with the university administration on these kinds of questions. Um, most recently, about a year or so ago, we established the York University Advisory Committee on Responsible Investing. That uh, group has faculty, staff, student representatives. It's, it's chaired uh, by Professor Enriquez from the Schulich School of Business. And that's one of the, the, the primary avenues by which we were beginning to take up these kinds of questions. And so certainly for you or, or members of the community that want to engage, want to bring your views forward, want to bring your suggestions forward, that's, a, that's an important vehicle um, that we have put in place to make sure that we can gather that input, assess 
you know, the issue in the context of, 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 of our responsibilities for managing the money and ultimately giving, giving rise to a response. Whether that results in divestment or other forms of engaging with the issue responsibly, um, you know, to some extent still has to be worked through the process because it's still in the earlier stages, but that's the platform. Um, and whether the, the engagement occurs through divestment or other, other uh, schools of thought, if you will, are, it shouldn't be about divestment. It's actually about engaging with those companies to change their practices. And the only way you can do that is if you're actually um, uh, a, a, an owner, if you will, through shares. So there's different views on that. This committee is also taking on that challenge as well. And so look forward to you engaging uh, with that group. Okay. Thank you, VP Brewer. Is there another question from the room? I have another question right here. This is from Denise McCloyd, a student who has a question for VP Lenton. As a master's student who only has to write her thesis and is currently classified as part-time, are there any bursaries available to students like me? I really hope that um, Janet Morrison might be here somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, my, my off the top would be that there must certainly be some bursaries that would be available um, at this point. But, but Janet, maybe I could just ask you to stand up and elaborate a little bit on your in-depth knowledge that would exceed mine. So we have a, a, a wide array of scholarship and bursary funds available uh, to students. And the best way to access uh, those monies is through the student financial profile. And so all students are encouraged to fill out that form that assesses their eligibility. Uh, and for more kind of specific access, come over to the Bennett Center and talk to one of our student client services representatives uh, so that we can deliver a more personalized level of service. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Could I invite a question from the room? Okay, not at the moment. All right. Um, I have a question for the president. This question has come. This question has come from Juan, who is clearly at Glendon, because the question asks: Any plans to host a town hall at Glendon? I and other Glendon students would love to meet you and participate in person. Well, let me start by by saying that I, I mentioned that quickly in my remarks. If you look at our strategic mandate agreement that was signed with the government, if you look at all the strategic plans we have, Glendon is, plays an important role, in my view, in the future of York University. And we, this university intends to continue to promote Glendon, expand the offerings in both official languages, and promote uh, 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 Glendon uh, because of its incredible uh, characteristics. So that goes without saying. Glendon, I should add, is blessed with having uh, a young, energetic, visionary leader who will actually help us move this uh, forward. I'd love to see uh, a town hall in Glendon. Uh, I, I may have to find a way to work with the uh, with the principal to have that done. I know he has had meetings with his colleagues and with uh, everybody. Uh, this president has a handicap, he doesn't mind. He's actually embarrassed to share with you, which I don't speak French. I understand a bit, but I don't speak French. So I have to work with the principal to find a way that we can get there, and if he and his colleague can accommodate my deficiency, I would be very pleased to do that. <laughs> I'm just being frank. I actually love to do that, and I love to share with them the, the incredible opportunities that are before York University and before uh, Glendon to move forward and serve our, our community and serve the province and continue to be a growing asset for York University. Thank you, President Shukri. I'll ask another question that has come to us via our social media. This question is from a student named Andrew. Andrew is asking VP Lenton, why has York not changed the Bachelor of Administrative Studies to a Bachelor of Commerce? Commerce. I feel it will make us more competitive in the marketplace. Well, I, <laughs> I won't go into all the details of um, how historically we came to offer a BBA and an IBBA at Schulich and the BAS um, at the School of Administrative Studies. However, uh, recently, 
the students have once again, because I think there were earlier uh, interest in doing so, have raised the possibility of converting the nomenclature of the BAS uh, to something like the, the BCom or business degree name that's more familiar, uh, familiar in the business community. And uh, the good news is, is that we are looking at actually um, that uh, potential name change. And so I hope to be able to give the student asking that question, as well as the general students in the School of Administrative Studies, an update on that soon. Thank you. A question from the floor? Nothing at the moment. Yeah, I'll come back to you. So very soon, I'm expecting a question. This question is for VP Brewer. Is it possible to invest in customer service training and internal relationships to strengthen collaboration between departments? It would benefit the entire community. This question comes from Elizabeth, a staff member. Um, I, again, a, a, another great question. Uh, and um, it's actually something that, uh, again, as part of the development of the IIRP process, in fact, we have um, looked at that as, as, as perhaps part of moving forward with the um, uh, administrative services in support of the academic uh, mission piece of the IIRP. Uh, and in fact, I think that notion of, of, of a customer service mindset, of a service mindset um, across all of the administrative areas of the university, not just in, 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 in those that report to me, but, but more broadly, I think will actually be fundamentally important. I think it's part of um, a number of initiatives. I could look to the, the SHARP budget model. In the SHARP budget model, I think there will be an expectation that all of the various providers of support to, to our academic colleagues will essentially, um, as we fully implement the model, have what would be called service level agreements. In other words, the service units that are providing support to the faculties will, in a sense, articulate this is what you can expect for us because you're, in a sense, supporting or funding us directly for that service. Um, so I think we will see that, that begin to take hold in the university where it may not exist now. Um, I think as part of the student experience in particular, and, and again, um, uh, VP Morrison and I have had uh, conversations. In fact, we've had our groups come together at least twice, her leadership team, my leadership team, to look at ways, particularly from a student perspective, um, we can improve the student experience on campus. As, as one of our other colleagues uh, said, the student experience isn't just what, uh, what occurs in the classrooms and in the labs, but it's what's going on in the lunchrooms, on the campus, and, and how you engage with the environment, and whether it's bookstore, parking, or um, you know, some of the services that Janet provides. Again, I think we need to, to begin to look at how we're responding to those that are coming to us for support, for advice, assistance, or things to be done. Um, and I'm looking forward to engaging in particular with Janet, who's done an awful lot of work in that area, to piggyback on what she's done and begin to roll that out in my division as well. So we, we have a bit of an integrated and consistent view. So again, early days yet, uh, but again, it's one of those things that has emerged through the development of the IIRP that a number of us are particularly excited about. Okay, great. Thank you. Mary Helen, I wonder if I could add a couple of comments to what Absolutely, Gary has said. Please. Maybe trying to make this not just seems very formal at the moment. We, because we're all very, trying very hard to stick to our time constraints, I didn't go into in any detail the IARP document. And I'm not sure how many of you um, have actually looked at it and how hard it would be to reverse back to that document. But I do think that it's really important for those of you who haven't read the Institutional Integrated Resource Plan to know that you know, I talked in my own presentation about the importance of this is an opportunity for us to make some bold moves. And when we um, did the review, and we had the task force reports, and when we looked at all the local integrated resource plans, where we landed on the IIRP, the Institutional Integrated Resource Plan, was, was there a set of initiatives that if we actually did take a pan-university approach, that it could facilitate that kind of bold movement forward that would really help advance and complement those local efforts. And we landed on six primary areas. And those six primary areas are, could, what could York do in terms of realizing our goals in our white paper for really ex excelling uh, and being excellent in the area of teaching and learning? We're actually known for high quality teaching and learning. So there's a tremendous amount that we could do there. Could we be bolder than we've been 
around so far around experiential education opportunities for students, technology enhanced learning, other signature pedagogies. Coming up with and really paying attention to the student experience, we know students want improved, seamless, one-stop approach to student advising. They want a preferred uh, um, improvements around the campus experience. We know we need to have a shared service model around administrative services. Faculties need to be paying attention to, and, they, and they've taken leadership already, and what could we do to enhance our quality degree programs and work together to streamline those degree programs? Research intensification. So we, that IIRP was specifically intended to identify some of the bold initiatives where we could build on what we've done, build on our strengths, but really help advance the university to achieve its full vision and the priorities that we have articulated in the white paper and the university academic plan. VP Lynch, if I could, I could ask you to actually expand based on a, a, a follow-up question from a student. Uh, it's around experiential education and how is York increasing more of the op these opportunities for students? This is from a student who, who feels that he or she has particularly benefited from EE. So again, what, what we did with the white paper, and it was also embedded in the UAP, was we identified experiential education as one of the leading pedagogies that we know that our students want. Every single student survey, Nessie, at the graduate level as well, they have all been requesting increased experiential education. And there have been tremendous uh, pockets of excellence that have been coming forward at the faculty level. You know, uh, Osgood has embedded an experiential uh, education approach, um, you know, to how they uh, to deliver their curriculum. I could give an example virtually in every uh, faculty for how we have embedded experiential education. But the thought was, how can we work together to actually share those best practices? And so what we've undertaken and what we're going to undertake over the next period of time is to really make clear the range of experiential education activities that different faculties have been developing, everything from what happens even in the classroom around role modeling and how you introduce uh, uh, even speakers and how that's done, all the way to community-based learning, community service learning, internship, co-op. There's such a broad range. York is a, really a leader around community-based um, uh, uh, service as well as community-based research, adding research activities. How do you do that collectively? So we want to share best practice, we want to develop common nomenclature, and most importantly, we want to be thinking about, is there a way for us to embed the infrastructure that would support all of those activities across the university to make it easier for every single program to be introducing, that's the goal, some component, some type of experiential education, so that York can make the commitment that in a number of years, every single student, irrespective of their academic program, will have access to experiential education. So we're looking at a range of um, those uh, possibilities of sharing and expanding those kinds of activities uh, over this next year. Thank you. Okay, I'll move on to another set of questions. I'm going to group these two because they both pertain to the subway. Uh, the, the first is a straightforward question about how near is the York University TTC terminal, near, how close are we to completion? But the follow-up, which I think is, is, a, is an important one because it comes from a, a member of our community that we don't hear from directly at town hall meetings often. It's from a student's mama, and she signed it mama. <laughs> so the question is, how will the safety of the York community be handled when the new subway station is complete. So time of completion and safety. <laughs> Not quite sure who to address this to. Um, but in any event, uh, I, I think I mentioned in one of my earlier responses, the, the current official schedule for the completion of the subway is the end of 2017. Um, and uh, that uh, is a number that comes from the TTC. Um, some months ago, they actually replaced uh, the project management or oversight uh, for, the, for the subway uh, completion and put it in the hands of an outside firm called Bechtel, who are a large, uh, very, very capable group. So hopefully they will be able to, um, uh, to, to stay the course and conclude that in 2017. On the issue of, of safety, and, and, and this is a hugely important question, um, we obviously are you know, in the run-up to the time when the subway will be operating. We clearly recognize that uh, 
uh, considerations that the subway will bring to the campus will have to be addressed. Obviously, we, we will be a much more open campus, both getting onto and getting off of the campus. Um, there will be portions of the subway stations, uh, the terminals that are both in the center of the campus, um, at the east end of the common, as well as the, uh, uh, the, the station on Steeles. Um, they will actually be uh, controlled by the Toronto Transit Commission. Effectively, they will be responsible for security within their facilities. And then, of course, as always, uh, an important partner uh, working with uh, York Security Services and all of the folks that support our, our, our on-campus resources is Toronto Police. So we have already begun to uh, look at what the implications of the subway are, look at how we will need to work with both TTC Security and the Toronto Police Service in an integrated way with our own um, campus safety officials uh, to make sure that we've actually got a, a, a seamless uh, you know, weaving together of all of those uh, primary uh, safety providers on campus. So there's a lot of work that, that's underway. We've initiated conversations, as I say, with TPS, with TTC, uh, to make sure we're on top of it. In addition, we've already, um, you know, begin to put in place another of measures, another type of measures that we feel would be important. Um, spending uh, a lot of time and money putting in uh, enhanced access control uh, in, in, in buildings across the campus. Um, this perhaps will be maybe not as, as comfortable for some, the notion, well, a university should be wide open 24-7, any building, any time. The reality is uh, that's not necessarily the stance we can take with an eye towards safety. So we are you know, investing in some of the necessary infrastructure and have been for some time to ensure that at the end of the day when the subway is here, uh, we can provide as, as safe a, an, an environment as possible. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Mama, wherever you are. Uh, I have a question from the room. Could I please get a mic down to uh, the middle of the front section? It's coming from this side. Hi, I'm Robert Tishima in the Department of Biology. I guess this is a question for President Shukri. If you can provide an update on the development and planning of the new Markham campus okay. since the big announcement. And also, more specifically, what is being done to ensure that this, our new satellite campus doesn't contribute immensely to the university deficit, that it's oh. not gonna be a major expense? Thanks for asking the question, I think it's very important. First, let me uh, show you the status of the campus. You know that uh, uh, there was a request for proposals. There were 19 down to 13 proposals. The government ended up choosing one, which is uh, the York uh, uh, proposal to start to build a campus in, uh, uh, in Markham in partnership with the city of Markham and, and the region and uh, as well uh, as other uh, partners. Where we are today is that uh, Infrastructure Ontario and the Ministry of Training College and Universities are working in order to prepare for submission to the Treasury Board so that the funds, the government funds that's allocated to the project be uh, actually allocated. You have, you have to go to the Treasury Board. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, our Vice President Administration and the President of uh, uh, York University Development Corporation on behalf of the university are working very closely with the Ministry of Training College and University Infrastructure Ontario to provide them with all the information required so that they do the, the assessment appropriately. And the assessment will not only include an application to the Treasury Board for the funds, but also uh, a decision has to be made about the delivery model. That is to say, the buildings that will be built, are they going to be built by Infrastructure Ontario or the government will hand the money to the university so that the university can uh, uh, undertake it the way we build buildings uh, on this side. Uh, Infrastructure Ontario builds the buildings for hospitals and for colleges, and they are considering how the delivery model is going to look like. So that's in terms of some of the, of the particulars about that. We should, this process should uh, uh, end by during uh, 2015, uh, at the end of which we should know uh, the delivery model and we should know the commitment of government through Treasury Board and the uh, source that will go to Cabinet and it will be part of the uh, next year uh, government uh, uh, budget. So that's one side. Of course, in order to do that, 
part of the planning, we cannot really, as I said uh, once and again, uh, that uh, we cannot allow the real estate and the construction and so on to go ahead of the academic planning. So input to the Vice President uh, uh, Finance Administration and input to York University Development Corporation and the work with government is coming from the provost and the deans. We're trying to finalize what are the type of programs that are going to be there and so on. And there are two types of programs we'd like to do there. One are programs that we're not currently doing here so they don't compete with the, with the, uh, with the Kiel campus. The other one will be the type of programs where we have here yet we cannot meet all the demand because uh, 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 the demand will, uh, uh, is, is overwhelming here that we can have sort of another section of the same program on, uh, on the Markham campus. In terms of your important question about, we believe, like I sincerely believe that first student on campus in, in the Markham campus, it's not gonna happen before 2019, 20, or maybe even 2021, given the speed with which I expect things to move forward, which will be the right time, as you can see from the charts we presented earlier, where the demand will start to increase. So I don't see the campus competing with Kiel in terms of enrollment. In fact, it is a, one of the answers that York University is going to deal with future demand that will continue to go in a few years, that will continue to go for a number of years afterwards, and mostly will be happening in the GTA. So between Kiel and uh, uh, Markham, and of course the enhanced Glendon, we will be able to make our contribution to the growth in demand. Now, with that, I don't see how resources, I don't believe that be a resource transfer from Kiel to, uh, to uh, Markham. We are already, as you've heard, we're already having issues with financial sustainability. In fact, this will be an opportunity for future growth. And of course, students will come with their funding, which will come from government grant, increased government grant, and increased uh, and the tuition fees uh, that will, 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 they will be paying. Uh, I don't believe that will be a burden on the university. I think it will represent more an opportunity for the university to accommodate future growth without allowing this campus to become much bigger than it is today. It will be an opportunity for us to take on new programs that are probably difficult to run here. It will be an opportunity for us to use it as also pilot for trying uh, 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 different things. So I hope I answered your question. I don't know if any, any of my colleagues wants to add anything. Please go ahead. You're tempted? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Thank you, President Shukri. There are, there are approximately 10 minutes left, so I want to make sure. We have lots of questions coming in online, but I do see another question from the House. So if we could get a microphone uh, to the back middle section. And while we're waiting for the microphone to arrive there, I will go ahead with a question from the online source. So if we can get. Uh, that question prepared. The, um, the next question uh, has, has to do with the debt, actually. It has, so as part of the incredible fundraising efforts made by the York alumni, is it possible to contribute funding to the $60 million, $60 million deficit? This is from Mandy, so I'm sure somebody on the end might be interested in taking this. To which deficit? The $60 million, oh. the, the, the overall deficit. Well, one of the, <laughs> if you don't mind me, I just want to give my, my perspective Absolutely. and then please, please go ahead. One of the reasons, you recall that York University used to fundraise to a separate foundation, which was a separate legal entity. One of the main reasons for, for moving this activity into the university was really three folds. Most people thought of it as a way to reduce costs, which it was, which was in some sense enhanced efficiency. But that's hardly the only reason. There are other reasons. One of the other reasons is to create, to ensure that there is close alignment between our academic objectives and the, our activities in fundraising. That is to say, we make sure that we fundraise as much as possible for the areas, academic activities that we want to undertake. And you see nowadays in the fundraising activities in the university, uh, the engagement of deans. In the past, there was only frankly, one or two deans that were engaged in fundraising. Now, every dean is uh, engaged in fundraising. There's total alignment between the central office to fundraise and what really is needed at the faculties. The third point, which is very related to the second point, is to make sure that here are our needs, 
here are our deficit. How do we deal with it? We make sure that we fundraise for the activities that we have to do anyway. Or activities that we would like to really invest in to build the strength that I talked about earlier. That I want to build a strength that will enable us to continue moving in the future. So there is a, that great alignment. For example, let's say faculty A has five retirements, what have you, or we need five new positions for faculty of science or for department of biology. Can we help, can we direct fundraising, if we identify this area, to work with the dean, with the department, with our donors, identify that need and say that we will raise money for chairs in the Department of Biology, as an example. And if we raise funds to support two positions, that means what we need is only to, the faculty will use its budget to only invest in three, and yet you have five uh, faculty members. That way, we can align the fundraising to help us cut our, the cost that we incur in our uh, operating budget. The other thing is in the area of scholarships. If we can increase, of course, scholarships and bursaries are needed all the time. It's a ma major area. And one way is to try and create, instead of continuing growth in the university's operating budget investment in scholarships and bursaries, can we actually focus our fundraising activities in raising money for these scholarships that we need to do to continue to support our uh, current and, and future, future students. The third area is the area of uh, infrastructure. Many of the buildings we have here because of need, uh, if you look at every building that has been built in the past, uh, including the building, I'm, I keep referring to you, Department, uh, Department of Biology here. When you have uh, uh, the life sciences, the new life sciences building, the government gave us $70 million, the university invested. Uh, 80 or 90 million dollars in order to make the building the, such, such an Im incredible building support uh, uh, our academic activities. The, money, the difference came from the university resources. Can we actually focus our fundraising activities to address that gap between what we need and what the government uh, 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 supporting us with? In other words, if we can make our fundraising activities targeted in order to address the gap between what we really need and what we want to do, what our aspirations are, versus money available through the operating grants or from the government, that will be, in my view, one way to make sure that fundraising is really, really aligned with, with our needs. And this is what started to happen. When you see a, a name of, of a donor on, an, on one of the buildings, that's because this donor put money that has managed to bridge the gap between what the, the government put at, or the university put and what the, total, the, the real cost has been. So this is how we are trying to make sure that our fundraising, and that will come clear, more clearly in the campaign uh, that is, uh, we are preparing for, where we will make sure that, uh, uh, that this is the case. I should add also that has been my experience over the years working with donors and so on. Actually, if you have very targeted objectives, the donors actually like that. I mean, there's always donors who want to invest in certain things that the, the, that's dear to their hearts, but as individuals. But I, all donors that I have dealt with want also to make sure that in investing in the next generation of Canadian, that their dollars is making maximum impact. And it, they're always willing to hear about what do we need? Where the dollar make maximum impact? Therefore, planning what we need and trying to align that with, with the, with the uh, uh, fundraising activities, I think it is helping us to try and bridge the gap. Whether it's bridge the entire gap or not, that's another thing. But it is certainly helping in that regard. I'm sorry, do you want to add anything? Not at all. I, I, <laughs> How I? I would only add that, uh, that this environment of being able to link our efforts uh, strategically with the, with the vision of the university 
uh, as Dr. Shukri said, is inspiring to our donors. Our donors want to know what our vision is. Our donors re respond to big ideas. Uh, and so it's not about the deficit, it's about where this university is going, the things that we think are really important. Uh, and so this process that we've been undertaking over the last few years to really align ourselves, to work with all of the deans, has been effective already. We're seeing an acceleration in, in the funds that we've raised. We're averaging annual fundraising results uh, much higher than they've been in the past. And it's, I believe, because of that strategic alignment. Donors do want to have a major impact. And so we're, we're going to continue on that road to ensure that those priorities are aligned and that what we take to our donors really will have a major impact to allow us to do the things that we simply couldn't do otherwise. Donors really like uh, to be able to, to see how that's going to happen in the future. So already that, that's taking hold uh, and, and our commitment is to continue to build and grow that. Thank you. Thank you. Have, do we have a mic on the, on the question? There are two questions at the back there. Oh, we, so we have a question here and we also have uh, a question back there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nadia Bello from the Center for Human Rights. I'm wondering if somebody could speak to the current process or plans to uh, fill the AVP human resources position, and more broadly, if we could speak to what the human resources priorities are, particularly for non-academic staff, um, and how they might align with the business plans, the research goals, and other priorities of the university. Thank you. OK. Um, that's uh, an important question. Um, the Human Resource Department reports to me as part of my portfolio. The AVP uh, reports uh, to me. Um, it's a position that's uh, been vacant uh, for several months now with the departure of the previous AVP. Um, where we are now is we're about to engage uh, an external search in order to move that process forward. It's a, it's a significant position. We have engaged uh, a search firm. We do have a search committee selected. Uh, we've just completed the, the candidate profile and the brief um, for that position, so we'll see that unfold over the next uh, several months um, and hope to conclude uh, by the end of the year or early next year. Um, uh, in that context, I would like to acknowledge um, the work that's being done by uh, Donna Smith, who has been uh, the acting AVP um, for some time now and, and has agreed to carry on uh, into the new year. Uh, in that role. Don is an experienced administrator at York and is, is, is working on just, you know, keeping things moving along as well as taking on some new things as, as, we, uh, as we look ahead. In terms of the priorities for HR, I mean, there's several and there's there a couple of different aspects of, of, of HR uh, when I think about it. I mean, there's what I would call the transactional kind of stuff, payroll, benefits, pension, those kinds of things. So this, just the day-to-day -day things that need to keep going. Um, and, and certainly in that regard, I, I think we do have some, some opportunities. And that will get taken up, I think, through the uh, IIRP process, that review of all of the administrative services in support of our academic mission. Um, so the transactional piece, uh, I, I think, will be a priority put through that lens of IIRP. Um, the other uh, area that I think we will see a need to put some considerable focus on is um, the um, aspects of change management. We've got a lot of change coming down uh, the pike, so to speak, if you look at all of the initiatives that you've heard about here today, positioning the organization um, to be able to achieve that, I think, can, in, 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 in a big way, uh, be enhanced by uh, our, our HR department recognizing the need for, for, for thoughtful change management and helping the organization position that, um, you know, driving forward as part of that, that you know, changing culture and so forth. Um, so that's one particular area that I think is the way that HR will need to connect with, if you will, the strategic objectives of, of the institution. Um, you know, that helping position us for change. Um, we've got a number of particular initiatives going forward in terms of investments in our systems, enhancing some existing system improvements that we put into place um, that uh, sort of are midway between those two extremes. But, uh, but maybe I'll just stop there in the interest of time. Okay. We are running uh, close to the end of our time together, but if I could, can I ask for one more question? One additional question? There's one at the back of the room, if I could get a microphone to... to. Yep. Thank you for passing the microphone along. Thank you. 
Gary, at the planning update earlier this year, you mentioned addressing uh, campus experience, specifically as it relates to cleanliness and, uh, and addressing deferred maintenance. And given the, the fiscal context we see ourselves in, I wonder if you can talk about what we can expect to see in those two areas over the next um, two or three fiscal years. <laughs> Building on the previous answer in response to fundraising, I would like to suggest that uh, chillers, boilers, uh, utility tunnels uh, could be part of linking uh, Jeff to donors. <laughs> I don't know, okay. um, but, but somehow I, I, I'm not sure they're quite I'm, as... I'm uh, not sure I can find a donor who's willing to invest in this. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that, it, it, it's an important question. And uh, I think in terms of... And there's maybe a couple of threads that I'll, I'll, I'll pull apart on that. In terms of the campus experience proper, and, and as I've mentioned a couple of times already, that looking at uh, the student experience and the campus infrastructure and what role that it can have in enhancing that student experience. Um, we recently put out a call, the, the provost and I, for uh, people to join a number of working groups. One of those working groups will be um, uh, tasked with that moving forward, the student experience uh, uh, campus infrastructure investment. So what I hope to do over the course of, 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 of the next several months is get that working group going, get input from our community, faculty, staff, and students alike to, to get, a, get a sense from them as to what they see are um, the, the, uh, the things that, that they would really like to have done in a priority order um, that if whatever money you have available, you've got to put it somewhere, put it there. So I'm hoping through that process we'll be able to get a, a, a sharper focus on what will matter most with the dollars that we have. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, there's a couple of areas that uh, will provide some opportunity as part of the, the, the build-up for this. I've already um, uh, asked uh, the CSBO folks to put together two um, lists for me. I think there's a couple of elements, and it really builds on those comments that you allude to that I had made earlier. And certainly washrooms doesn't sound very appealing at, at first at, at first uh, hearing it, but they're really, really important to the campus experience. So we're putting together a, a detailed list of what we can do with washrooms. Classrooms, the same thing. That's kind of a frontline, uh, you know, teaching and learning experience. And we're putting together an integrated list of how we can address uh, some of the real maintenance, deferred maintenance issues in our classrooms um, and, and begin to move forward. The good news is, notwithstanding the financial restraints that we have, um, the government had indicated in an early budget that they would finally begin to start to move additional funds towards facility renewal. Our, our, our grants for the past few years have fallen to about one and a half million. That's going to be doubling over the next few years and, and more than that growing to about six million dollars a year a few years out. So we actually do have a pool of money that we heretofore did not have that we can uh, I think use to start to fund some of those initiatives that come through this priority setting process that we're about to undertake. Thank you. And with that, I fear that we've run out of time uh, for today's town hall. But uh, so thank you, first of all, for uh, the, the important and interesting information. Uh, but I would like to encourage everybody who's both watching online and in the room. I know that there are still questions out there and the conversation does not have to end. Please post your questions on yorku.ca forward slash town hall. Uh, and we can continue talking about the things that are important to you. Thank you for all of those who participated. Uh, clearly, this is a campus that's really uh, um, uh, engaged about the future of this university, uh, and I appreci we appreciate hearing all of your ideas and, and uh, your concerns today. Thank you very much. Yeah.